Hello. I don't know if you can see me all that well. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm in a different place. Um, the sliding is horrible. Uh, but in any case, if you can't see me, at least you can hear me. Hopefully. Um, this is the recorded lecture to go with um, chapter four. Uh, I didn't give you a recorded lecture. This, this is better. Um, here's George. Uh, for the previous chapter, uh, chapter two, um, uh, but hopefully you were able to read the notes and apply it. Um, and I'm hoping that you're keeping up with everything. Um, I know it's tough and it's asynchronous, but um, and, and summer is, is always tense. Uh, but hopefully you uh, care about your education, so you're keeping up with everything. Um, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. Um, I've got the notes on there uh, for. Um, chapter 4, um, and you can uh, look on KC and you can look at all that stuff. Uh, I also have uh, Pericles' funeral oration um, by Thucydides if you want to uh, read that, and you should because, because it's important to read stuff like that to be an educated person. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'll quickly sort of go through the elements of uh, what Campbell and Jameson uh, say uh, constitute national eulogies. I'll let you sort of look at the notes for the definition of national uh, eulogies. Um, but then I want to apply it uh, to what I think is probably the most recent um, example of a uh, national eulogy, and that is President Obama's uh, speech in Newton, uh, or Newtown, um, regarding uh, the, uh, the, the tragedy at Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School. Um, and also, what I'm trying to do here is get the sliding is horrible. Um, is to showcase how I want you to write the first paper. Remember the very first paper, and it doesn't necessarily have to be five pages; it can be uh, longer. Um, uh, and also, if you uh, have the sources and stuff like that, again, you need to have um, a citation page and everything like that. And I prefer that you use MLA. Um, but I want to sort of show you how I would do this, and also remember that you can use multiple um, uh, genres, so you don't have to pick necessarily the ones that I'm covering. It can be the inaugural, it can be a national eulogy, it can be you know, all, any of the genres covered in our book, and we'll cover uh, more stuff next week. Um, but give you a sense of how I want these uh, papers written. Um, so sort of apply it to, again, Sandy Hook. Um, First, let me just quick, quickly remind you of what the elements are for this particular um, type of presidential speech. Um, the first element is that it's eulogistic rhetoric. Um, so it's a eulogy. It's not just a eulogy. It's, the national eulogy is bigger than just a eulogy, but it, it's eulogistic rhetoric, uh, which basi basically means, again, that death is recognized, to begin the process of healing. Uh, the speech must facilitate the transformation of physical to spiritual being, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, death is only death of the flesh, so the president has to indicate how the dead live on in our memory, et cetera. Um, and there's always going to be some sort of commitment for the living to carry on the mission of the dead. Uh, those are different elements or aspects of eulogistic rhetoric. And again, that's the very first element of this type of speech genre. The second element is called the uh, priestly role. So the president takes on the role of a priest or a minister or a reverend, whatever you know, we want to call it. So the, the service becomes sort of a national service um, for the deceased. So you see the president quoting um, a lot of stuff from uh, the Bible. Um, and again, it's almost always a, a, a Christian uh, situation. Um, it wouldn't be terribly popular for a president to cite the, the Quran. Um, and then uh, the president tries to comfort and reassure not only the, the real victims, but the country as a whole. There's always some sort of tie to God and justice and, and all that type of stuff. So that's the second uh, element. And then the next element, uh, the president needs to try to transform the deaths into symbols of national resilience. So one of the big things here that's really important, um, Campbell Jameson say there are two questions the president um, needs to answer here. 
what does the catastrophe, whatever it is, mean and how is the country going to act in order to ensure that it does not recur. Um, and part of that, again, is transforming the deaths into symbols of national resilience, uh, just like uh, Reagan did with Challenger. Um, and, I mean, there's lots of different uh, things here. Um, uh, the president often talks, talks about how the, the folks who d died are symbols. Um, they become metaphors, in a sense, for, for certain things. Um, there's a lot of uh, ideas about the deceased become heroes. Uh, there's a lot of ideas about how um, you know, the dead have tr transformed into symbols of, of America. Um, and then, of course, again, you know, the, 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 the deceased become metaphors or, or you know, symbols of things like courage, determination, selfishness. That that's sort of the norms of what we see in these types of speeches. And then the final um, element is, again, it's the, all these sort of blur into one another, but it's forestalling a repetition of the catastrophe. So the president often indicates that it, this is never going to happen again, the government is going to take certain action, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Though sometimes, obviously, the president knows that uh, he or she cannot fix the problem, um, so sometimes the call to action is somewhat more implicit. Um, and then in the accidents, the, the president oftentimes never blames or faults the people, but some sort of larger system. Um, and of course, there's, you know, it, it all sort of depends on the situation. You know, obviously, if it's a terror attack, um, you can um, blame the terrorists. Um, but, okay, so, so those are the elements. So, again, for the national eulogies, we got four basic elements that we see in these types of speeches. It's eulogistic rhetoric, first element, president takes on a priestly role, that's the second element. The president tries to transform the deaths into symbols of national resilience, that's the third. And then the final thing we very often see in these types of speeches is the president tries to showcase how he, or again she perhaps in the future, um, will, will forestall a repetition of the catastrophe. So if I were you, and I was using this um, genre uh, for your first paper and applying it to, uh, again, what I think is one of the most recent examples of, um, of a national eulogy, the Sandy Hook speech, here's how I would write that paper. First, I would read the speech. Um, but think about paragraph one probably um, talking a little bit about the context. What, what is Sandy Hook? What happened? Uh, so, you know, you contextualize uh, what's going on. Um, and that could be a fairly brief um, paragraph. And the second paragraph, what I would do, um, and by the way, um, I really want these papers to be really, really good. And so I, I want to see rough drafts, and I want you to start writing these and play, thinking about these now. You know the key to excellent writing is revision, revision, revision. Not only does your writing become better, but your thinking becomes better. Um, and, and a lot of you can't write nor think, so, you know, this, this is... <laughs> I'm joking, but, the, you know, you should um, go through lots of different ra uh, drafts. So if you contextualize it, if that's sort of the first paragraph. The second paragraph could simply be, if you wanted to use the elements as your organizational structure, okay, the next paragraph, or at least maybe a couple of paragraphs, is going to discuss uh, how President Obama's discourse was eulogistic. And, and also, by the way, in the first paragraph, you need a, an argument, you need a thesis. I want you to make an argument about, you know, I think this was an effective speech because of X, Y, and Z or this was not an effective speech because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, remember in the chapter, Campbell and Jameson talk about how they thought Reagan offered a great response to the, uh, the Challenger explosion. Uh, Clinton gave a great response to the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, Bush gave a lame uh, response to Hurricane Katrina in lots of different ways. Um, so you, you certainly can evaluate how effective you think this speech was whatever your topic is and, and how you think it functioned. 
and how it worked, maybe to you know, create um, new policies or, or whatever. So eulogistic rhetoric. So when we look at this speech, um, you know, and if you read the speech is on Casey, so you can you can read it. But what I've done is simply made some notes, and I went through this speech and tried to, even though I, these things blur together, sort of um, showcase um, examples. So I would have an argument. Your topic sentence could be something like, you know, we see many instances of eulogistic rhetoric in President Obama's speech at Sandy Hook. For instance, blah, 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 blah. And so you can give some specific instances, some quotes from the speech, uh, and then you can discuss how you think this is uh, working or being effective or not um, for the audience, both the audience there, also uh, the audience watching, because remember this was televised, it was a good big national uh, eulogy and everything like that. Um, and um, so, eulogistic rhetoric. Uh, this is stuff is all over the place. Um, you know, we can see it, and really the second paragraph. If you look at the second paragraph here. I got, I got my iPad here. I got my uh, phone here. I've got President Washington here, washing over me, and um, got my uh, my laptop in front of me. But so, you know, we gather here in memory of 20 beautiful children, and six remarkable adults. They lost their lives in a school that could have been any school in a quiet town full of good and decent people that could be any town in America. So, in, in all, there's so many different uh, examples um, of eulogistic rhetoric throughout this. Um, you can see it toward the end, trying to uh, find uh, strength through it. I mean, at the very, very end of the speech, it's not a very, very long speech, and usually these speeches are not very long speeches, but you know, he names uh, all the children who died, Charlotte, Daniel, Olivia, etc. God has called them all home. For those of us who remain, let us find the strength to carry on and make our country worthy of their memory. May God bless and keep them, those we've lost in his heavenly place. May he grace those we still have with his holy comfort. And may he bless and watch over this community and the United States of America. So there's, there's tons of eulogistic rhetoric. So again, if I were doing this second paragraph, or at least you know, paragraph two or three, whatever, here are instances of eulogistic rhetoric in the speech. Then I would move on, paragraph four or five, wherever you are, um, to showcase how the discourse or how the president took on a priestly role through his discourse. And you can have a topic sentence. We can also see how President Obama took on a priestly role in his speech in Newtown. So, you know, the president leads sort of national service or sees so this is a nationally televised thing. This is not just for, you know, the folks at Newtown. Uh, so it, there's lots of references to God. I mean, look at the uh, second paragraph. The second paragraph, right after President Obama says, I'm, you know, Thank you, thank you, Governor, to all the families, first responders, to the, the community of Newtown clergy, guests. And then straight to this. Scripture tells us, quote, Do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is internal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have building from God, a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And there's lots of uh, examples here of the priestly voice. Um, the third, um, it's throughout. So any time, I mean, look at the very, very end again before he sort of. Um, uh, has the, the very closing, it names all the, the kids who were murdered. Um, you know, he talks about all the world's religions, so many of them represented here today, start with a simple question. Why are we here? What gives our life meaning? What gives our acts purpose? We know our time on earth, this earth is fleeting. It talks about God's heavenly plans. 
but the little